With these frames are going back to the beginning of the movie, which we didn't see, I didn't show in class last week, although I summarized the events. At the beginning of the movie, even before the frame with the title, we have a science fiction setting in the planet Cybertron as you are elected by the caption and clearly you see that there is a war, there is destruction going on. In fact, in this premise to the movie itself, the theme that is being introduced is the theme of loss. The loss in the other protagonist of the movie, B-127, or as Charlie will call him, Bumblebee, the loss in his life of a droid is the loss of a home, his home planet. The loss of a community, the community of Optimus Prime and all, and all the other droids that are his brethren. And of course, the premise establishes the premise for the connection, the human slash machine connection between B-127 and Charlie, because Charlie herself has suffered a loss in her life, which is the loss of her father. In both B-127's life and Charlie's life, this event prevents them from moving on, prevents them from continuing with their usual life. So B-127 will be sent to Earth on a mission, but it's also in a way being thrown out of his comfort zone, the familiar places, whatever the places he calls them. In the case of Charlie, Charlie Watson, the female protagonist of the movie, the loss of her father is also accompanied by two significant interruptions, which will be visualized by the film in small and big ways. One is the loss or the interruption in the work on the vintage Corvette, and the other is the interruption in her sports activities as a diner. Of course, at the very end of the movie, the gap, the hole, the interruption will be addressed and B-127, Bumblebee, will reunite with Optimus Prime and with more of his droid friends who are coming to Earth to reconstitute a community and the interruptions in Charlie's lives, life will be mended, will be healed with Charlie doing a dive for the first time, but this time she will dive to save her putative father in a way, Bumblebee, and also in the epilogue, after the initial final credits, she will be able to fix the Corvette, okay? And of course, all of this becomes symbolic of her finding her ground, finding her strong identity, an identity that she feels comfortable with, that she can project comfortably in the outside community. So there is war, there is violence, there is loss, Notice the work that was done in the special effects with the droids, with the faces and the eyes. Because faces and eyes are used to identify good droids, good humans, bad droids, bad humans. This is achieved through the size and the shape of the eye. Small eye usually mean be beware, stay away from. And 
round, big eyes, of course, are the universal code for love me, hug me, I'm a puppy, I'm a baby. Okay, that's the universal natural code. All puppies and human babies also tend to have bigger eyes, and those eyes are more emphatically represented in comic books and illustrations or movies. Also, the color of the eyes is significant, where red means blood, and of course it is accompanied to violence. It's not bad versus good altogether, because even B-127 can have red eye when he is in fighting mode. Okay? So, there is war, there is fighting, and there's the mission, Optimus Prime, showing the Earth to the smaller B-127, who will be spared from the fight, but also sent away in a kind of exile from his own world. And a few frames later, you see B-127 looking down from his capsule, the capsule that will take him out of Cybertron and all the way to the Earth, looking down to signify what he's about to lose, or to lose contact with, okay? And in fact, right then and there, you have clearly this play with the eyes, with the shape of the eyes, with the eyelids, and this in many ways is a staple in movies by Steven Spielberg for the first period, think of E.T. among many, and even though Spielberg was not the director of this movie, he was the executive, executive producer, so he may have given a hint to the kind of style, of visual style, and representation of emotion that he wanted for this kind of movie, so that it could be moving both for a younger audience, but also for an audience of adults who uh, can, can feel these kinds of stories in themselves. And again, it looks dark, but it's not as dark as if you look at the images, it's just the projector it doesn't have enough light. And in terms of loss, right after B-127 looks down at the battle that is still ongoing, the farther away he moves from the planet, the more distraction he and the audience can see. So, the theme of loss is clearly set for this particular character. And we have the title, and the movie can proceed with Earth. The next frame will tell you that it's 1927, but we'll skip that. And we find other fighters. Without eyes, because the, when you don't see the eye, then you have this ambivalent feeling of possible threat. These are soldiers who are training, and their officer, John Cena, is introduced, but is introduced in a very jo jokey, cordial way. Tough guy, can be aggressive, can be violent, but clearly he's not completely bad, right? And so this sets the pace for the development of the character, who by the end will jump sides will move from the side of the evil military infrastructure to the side of the good guys, because he will recognize and acknowledge the heroism of both Charlie and Bumblebee. The soldiers have time, barely time to regroup from the exercise that one of them notices something in the sky and this is, sets the style for one of the favorite movements of the camera. There are two kinds of movements of uses of camera, angles, and editing that you find repeated time and time again in this movie. One is up and down, because of course it's a relationship between the Earth and the stars, the Earth and the planets, from which these alien beings are coming. So, a lot of movements that go from down, up, up, down. The other, done mostly with editing, is 
two characters more often, less often, three or more, but usually two characters looking at each other. And this time, when they look at each other, the way the camera and the editing work is that you see clearly whether they look at each other with appreciation, consideration, affection, or contempt, or a sense of, you don't exist for me, I see you, but I don't recognize who you are. You are nothing to me. Your identity is not being acknowledged. Vice versa, at some point in the movie, those exchange of eyes, of gazes, of gazing eyes, will result in the affirmation, I see you and I see who you are, and therefore, this is an act confirming your true identity that is emerging, that is becoming public. Finally, the last way of using the eyes of the characters is either to anticipate an event, for example, in this case, look, something is about to happen, right? So, and it's a very basic elementary style, very didascalic, meaning that it shows you what you're going to experience and how you're supposed to react as a viewer. So look, beware, prepare, something is coming. Or I look at something, but I'm not really focusing at it because I'm looking inside. I'm looking inside, looking for answers, or looking at my own emotional world. Those will be the variety of usages of frames with eyes, especially closer shots, right? And there it is. We're looking up, and there is B-127 crashing through the atmosphere, and finally getting there, and right then and there, you see the tire, you see the wheel in his Transformers body, which is an anticipation of the fact that he can transform into a car, and you see John Cena looking very perplexed at what just landed, and then we focus on the eyes. And again, this is a typical example of, I'm looking at something, but I'm also looking inside. I'm looking at something, but I'm also wondering, what the heck is this? I'm looking at something, and I'm trying to acknowledge the identity of this object. Later on, it will be, the identity of a person, right? Or the social place of this person. Let me. Okay. And the same happens with, with B127, who's looking at the soldiers, trying to make out what this situation is about. And you see that the eyes are not narrow or completely open. They're in between, because narrow would mean I'm about to become aggressive or I'm scared. And bigger eyes would signify I'm completely open to you and open to a relationship, which is not, of course, the case for the encounter with the soldiers. We know that this drawing can transform into something. How? By looking at this thing, right? He can focus his gaze on a jeep from World War II and transform into it. But this is code, clearly, for the experience of a teenager who can look around in her family, in her high school, with her friends, and find, or her father, but unfortunately her father is not there anymore, and find a model to fixate on, and then transform into it, right? Everything in this movie, once you understand the, the simple uh, grammar, everything is 
very simple, very evident, very conspicuous. You know you must have heard that the ideal viewer for Hollywood is someone with the mind of a 12-year-old. So things are shown once, twice, three times. If you miss it once, you catch it later. So multiple times these things are repeated. John Cena sets the chase. His group of soldiers chases after B-127, who changes into a jeep and goes away. And once again, you have this kind of eye signifying, I'm looking at something, but I'm trying to figure out what I am looking at. And if I'm trying to figure out, if I'm wondering, then I'm not an aggressive soldier anymore. Because an aggressive soldier will not care about what the target is. I have a target, I'll focus on the target and kill the target, right? That should be the logic. So from the beginning you understand that Cena is slightly more complex than the machine-like soldier who is a killing machine. He has a heart, he has a mind where doubts can blossom and create something. The soldiers shoot at B-127, he reaches a mine to find refuge, he's looking at the mine and at the same time the soldiers are coming and therefore he goes into this fighting modality where his face is covered by this kind of uh, helmet and you can barely see his eyes and clearly it's more of an aggressive look at this point. He goes down because the soldiers are fighting at him, he experiences some damage and this is the way he looks around and even in the target look you can see that he's looking at the eyes, right? Which is not necessary to acquire a target but it's necessary because this is the grammar of the movie. Look at the eyes and everything will come from that. And once again, something is about to happen. Look away. Please know that somebody else is going to intervene in this battle. And therefore you see a soldier telling you, the viewer, to expect a surprise. John Cena repeats that. And of course we have a closer shot and there it is, something that looks like a Phantom F4, famous fighter from the 1970s, but in fact is another Transformer, a Decepticon, that has come to attack B-127. B-127 recognizes this. Why the round eyes here? Can you guess? Can anyone give me? If a fight is about to happen, why the big eyes that signify heart and emotion? Tell me, how do you decode that? I think he's afraid. No? No. It's not complete. Afraid for himself? I think for himself. No. Both for himself and the soldier. This is code to signify there will be violence and destruction. And he's not just worried about himself, but he knows that soldiers will also be casualties of this battle once the fighter transformer attacks that area. So the round eyes here mean empathy, not just being scared, but empathy for the soldiers again. And once you catch on it, you, you can unpack these frames even more easily. Again, John Cena trying to decipher what the heck is going on. Okay, but again, why do you have all these faces by the same actor with these puzzled looks? Keep in mind, it's just to let you, the viewer, understand he's not the killing machine. He might look with all these body muscles and these big guns. He's someone who thinks before shooting, right? And there it is the symbol of the Decepticon and a rocket uh, uh, going 
to be prepared. And this time you cannot escape. Before it was slightly ambiguous, but now you also have the eyelids. He's sad. He's sad not just for himself, but for the amount of distraction that will take place. And there it is. Right? It's not just him being attacked. The soldiers are down. Everything is exploding on fire. And there are the eyes of the good, of the bad guys. Red and narrow, right? And the rest of the face goes with it. A much more robotic face, less human face. And B-127 is down and getting up. Something else that will happen a number of times. He's being shot at, goes into battle mode with a helmet, and goes into a confrontation. And so, one of those close encounters, I'm looking at you, you're looking at me, but to signify hostility and contrast, he's being damaged, the uh, voice box is being ripped from his body so that he will not be able to communicate, and there it is, in case you missed it, speech synthesis disabled, and he's down completely. However, he manages to take the rocket, put it in the side of the other transformer, and react, right? So there he stands again. He has won this battle. However, his memory cells are failing, John Cena is also down, right? Because he needs to absorb not just the violence that he has experienced, but the strange encounter, and he needs to reflect on that. And he's looking around B-127 for something, a vehicle he can transform into. This one is too big to calculate, to compute. So he turns to something smaller, easier for his damaged chip, and that's the Beetle, the Volkswagen Beetle, the yellow Volkswagen Beetle. And then we go to dark with this initial shutdown and frame after frame, it becomes dimmer and dimmer, but out of the fuzzy lights, you have more light coming out. So we are going to dark, but before it becomes completely dark, the small lights expand again because this becomes the transition to the red LEDs on the clock of, uh, uh, of, of uh, Charlie on her nightstand. And of course, it's 7.20, 7.59 at eight, the clock will go ah, 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 ah. and this is the first of three mornings in the story of Charles of Charlie okay nothing easier than complete a story over a cycle of three days there it is the hand of Charlie and how is she introduced before we see her face, we see this piece of technology. Now, you may not be familiar, maybe you're not able to recognize this as a Sony Walkman or a similar device to listen to music on tapes from the 1970s and 80s. So in case you missed it, and of course, you will be able to see fast forward and other, the, the stop button, but there it is, the posters with musical groups and singers, so you know that she's a teenager, that she loves music. What else represents her? Toy cars. Now, I don't know, again, if the projector is bright enough for this, but what is significant about these cars? What do you see that is significant for the movie? What kind of cars are we seeing? Even briefly, but the movie, again, will repeat the same motif, even in reference to cars, several times. So what kind of cars do we see here? Yes, please. I guess 
especially older wounds that um, she was inclined to fix, especially again at the auto shop. So we see two Corvettes. Neither is the one she's trying to fix. They're from different periods. This is from the late 19, well, early 1970s, and that is from the 1980s, right? But the theme of the Corvette and her passion for cars is there. Then on this side, you see a car from the past. The theme is she appreciates the past. She doesn't live in the present. She's not blind to the past in general, her past in particular. What's over there in the darkness? Hide it in the darkness. In a blue color. A Volkswagen Beetle. Yes, it is. And what else? She's been defined by in terms of object. Trophies showing her as a diver. But these trophies are not on a shelf. They're in a box because she's about to throw them away because with the loss of her father she stopped training to be a diver she stopped enjoying her growth as an athlete as well as she couldn't finish working on the Corvette she couldn't finish by herself and make the Corvette go okay what else more objects to qualify the character before we even see her face. Stuff from a junkyard, pieces of cars, because she's a tinkerer. So you know that she's down. And we'll see her face, we'll see that she's throwing away her trophies. But if she's a tinkerer, maybe she'll find a way to fix herself. <clears throat> she'll find a way to fix and find a solution to her problems. Finally, we see her. Clearly, she's not happy. She's squeezing her eyes. I don't want to wake up. I don't want to get up. I don't want to go to school, right? I don't want to face life. This is the first morning. We'll see that the other mornings will be quite different. And she gets up, she goes to the bathroom, but before she brushes her hands, on her portrait on the portrait with her father and in case you missed it the movie will zoom into it to show charlie next to her father attached to him and you also see what is the dynamic in this picture what does it tell you between the father and the daughter in terms of their attitudes yes hillary they're really close, but... Uh, they have bonds. So I'm sorry? They have bonds, like, they have, like, special relationships. Mm -hmm. Who's first and who's second? Who's in the foreground? Who's in the background? The who's more powerful, more of a leader? Who's more passive? Okay, the father is the center of this picture, right? The anchor for Charlie. Charlie is seen as more passive, right? So you understand from the picture, you're supposed to understand from the picture that without the leadership, the guidance of her father, she's kind of lost. In reference to what? There is another picture, right? What's the next picture to the side? She with her diving team. So you understand why she's throwing the trophies away and stopping this activity because her leader has left and therefore she's quitting with him and one of many frames in which a character is looking especially Charlie and herself she's looking at herself in the mirror she and she has this thousand years gaze right she's not seeing herself she has not found herself. She's listening to music. She sees a pimple, right? And of course, she's unhappy about that. However, in front of the mirror, she's also improvising a drumming session because you have to know that she has pent up energy. Because when you will see her depressed and down in her family's kitchen 
or at school or with friends, you know that that is not really who she is. She has dreams, she has energy, but she's not able to pull them out in a structured way that would resist the look from others, the judgment from others. And there you go, the trophies in a box and then in the trash can. And she goes into the kitchen and she's looking at other people. But what she's looking is kind of a look from the outside. It's her mother with her stepfather. Clearly, she's not part of the picture. She is a couple that is joined, supporting each other, but they mean nothing to Charlie herself. It's not something that she can find strength in, because that's not her father, right? And there they are, they're into each other, they're looking at each other, they're kissing each other, and she has this look, I'm not in, I'm out. This love doesn't reach me, doesn't help me. Okay, and the mother is judgmental, and she cannot withstand the judgment of others yet. And her stepfather is being preaching and judgmental as well. Wow, well, look at that. My family had chairs like these in a small room, in a family room in my apartment in Italy, I guess, because of the time, 1970s, 1980s style. Anyway, she's here all alone in the kitchen, surrounded by stepfather, mother, dog. She's alone. And she's trying to put up a face. The actress is, has done a beautiful job, uh, has an incredible uh, expressive uh, technique. So clearly you see that she's trying to play along, right? But it's not what she would like. And why do you have a pet in here? Because we have to know that she, even though that they have a dog, because they have to be the typical family, she's not attached to it because her pet will be Bumblebee, right? So there has to be another hole in her heart ready to be occupied by Bumblebee. And there you see the face of someone who's not happy with what happens to, to her. Of course, notice the Mr. T serial. Uh, the 18 TV series from the 1980s. These movies are always period perfect. The scenes are always full of perfect uh, artifacts. And there you go, the brother. And once again, what the scene, what this part of the scene wants to emphasize is that the brother is also a stranger to her, that she's not finding any real love or support even in her small brother at this point, her little brother. And she looks at him coming in, all cocksure, all confident, right? And very well loved. This is not the reaction her mother had to her entering the room or her stepfather, right? Give me a hug and look at the stepfather, I'm looking at him. And then we move to the next scene, the amusement park where she works. And once again, we go from up, down. So the images from the top of this ride, going down, farther down, and even farther down to the bottom of this bucket because this is the drudgery, the dirt in her life. She has to work the lemon and make lemonade. And then we go up, up again, up, and we find her, her usual sad face. And this costume, which is a mockery of the fact that she doesn't have a role or an identity, right? But others around her are very confident. This high school, uh, this, this woman from her high school knows what she's doing. 
of course, do I need to say anything about the sexual innuendo in, in these frames? And she's looking at them, right? She's looking at them trying to understand how she can get in. Again, it's another look from the outside. And from the top, going down, we have another character, Memo. There it is, Memo, very cordial. And Memo sees her. He's the only one at this point who sees her as a person. In fact, she would like to be with her. But she doesn't see him, right? She comes out. And of course, Memo is there, completely ignored. And then she's not able even to see the others. She bumps into this guy who's the coolest, the hottest uh, man in the high school, surrounded by the, uh, the, the coolest uh, women. And there it is. She's embarrassed herself and she's being judged. Everyone is looking at her in a negative way. And they're making jokes about the accident. And all these people know how to handle the public situation. They're very comfortable in public. She's not, of course. She sees this as a terrible crisis. And all the others are still going along, socializing, and of course, they have a car, and she doesn't. And in case you missed the fact that cars are important, there it is. He's touching the car and getting closer to the woman. And in case you missed the plate that says you wish, there you have it. A close shot. You wished you had a car as cool as that. And instead, she has a moped with a plastic box in the bag. However, she's more serene now, right? Because she's going to her place. This is Hank. Hank is not judging her. Hank is kind of rough, uh, not completely refined, but certainly uh, he, he has a good opinion and is warm in a strange way with her. And then she helps the black mechanic, right? He says, give me uh, seven eighths. And she says, no, you need half. So he's asking for a size tool. She gives him another size. And of course, she's right. And now she's being looked. But the first positive look in this movie after memo comes from the guy, right? Because the guy's impressed. Because he was wrong. Because the tool she gave him, the different tool she gave him, is the right tool, in fact, right? So this is where she comes closer to finding a grounded identity. And she goes by herself in the junkyard, and you see her in an environment where she feels more positive, right? She knows where to go, how to move, what to do. She knows how to find perils, treasures, and of course there's this small accident, but it's the only accident, it's not like she's uh, uh, a complete dork, it's just that the accident has to reveal the headlight, and the headlight means the eye of the beetle, so she comes closer, and she's puzzled, right? Again, she's looking at the car, but not really focusing on it, more dreaming about this car. Looks at it again, and then she's being looked from inside. This is the car, B127 looking at her. She's coming closer, of course, in case you didn't know this is Bumblebee, let's put bees in it. Okay, so you won't miss it. And the car is being revealed, and she gets inside and she's finding something, right? There is dirt, but there is more that catches the eye. Of course, we need to see the 
emblem to know that this is a droid. And she gets in. And she finds her place around and she looks at herself. How different is this mirror face from the other face in the mirror we saw before, right? How much more positive, happier, full, brimming with possibilities her face is. And in fact, the other frames develop this idea and she plays the part very beautifully. Okay? And then the keys. You can do something with this. You can go places. Right? So she tries, she puts on the radio, and we go up again because the radio signal is traveling the skies and reaching another planet. And there we go up and up, finding two enemy droids torturing one of the Autobots to know where B-127 is, and you see the bad guy with small red eyes, and down we go again into the car. And this time the bees scare Charlie. But of course, it's a continuation between the enemies, the hostile forces scaring the Autobots like B-127, the threat coming from the space, and the small threat from the bees. So, danger on another planet, danger inside the car. It's a transfer that signifies something that will come later on. So she closes the door, she goes to Hank, she pays for the junk she found, goes back home, and there we see her in the garage, right? And a reminder, the toy Corvette, a picture with her father, another picture very similar to the other one, signifying this car represents her connection with the father she loves. Bigger car, wider shot, and then an even bigger car, and then a real car, and down we go from up, we go down to find her under the car, but she comes out. She cannot fix the car, she's desperate. Fixing the car, the impossibility, in the car represents her impossibility to find a solution to her life and the rest of her family is perfectly happy and joined and one with one another and she comes in again into this scene you see her coming in looks at them she's not part of this group she's not getting any strength any energy out of it and they're watching um, what's the name of this Alf Alf Ralph Alf. Strange TV series, Great, very successful with this uh, puppet. Again, she's lost. She hasn't found herself yet. And very much sad and depressed. And the others are happy. Goes back to bed and comes up again. Next morning, no look at the picture in case you missed it the other two times. Caress. And again, from the dead father to the stepfather who is so much loved by her mother, but she's not part of this equation. She comes in and again she's looking into the couple, but the couple is like their own unit. And they make fun of her because it's her birthday, but it's all she's all roughed up. And they give her a gift, which is another tease, because it's not a car that she would have liked as a gift. It's a helmet. It's a hippie helmet where in San Francisco for her moped to make her even more ridiculous as someone who turned 18. And stepfather gives her a book. It says, smile for a change, and models the smile. So she's made fun of, goes back to bed, covers her eyes. She doesn't want to look at anything. And there she is. But this time, after she covered her eyes, this time she's thinking of something. You have this dreamlike kind of gaze, right? And what is she thinking about? She got an idea, gets up, goes to her place, the junkyard, goes to Hank and says, I want the little car. I'll work for a year. I'll even clean your horrible toilet. And of course she says, 
take the car Okay. Something is happening, the computer must be slowing down for another process in the background. what is going on otherwise I can go back here and continue from the pages She goes to Hank. Make this full screen. And he says, just just take the car. Right? Hank is a positive character. So she goes back. We look at the car, adjust the bottom of the front because the headlights are the eyes. She works on the car, view from the top. And finally, the car starts and she starts smiling, but also look at her air in here. It's the look of a more mature woman, right? It's not the rough, the roughy, scrappy girl we saw before. She does look like a woman in here. She's finding her feet in this kind of, and then of course she, she smiles and she's so happy. And this time people are watching looking at her go by and they're puzzled they don't know what happened she's different so they're wondering what she did but they're trying to measure to sense the change that is occurring and there she is first we see the car because the car is the vessel of her change and then there she goes don't forget that there is a tow truck in case you were wondering, is this safe? Is this a good move? And then Hank will say, oh, it's a piece of junk. In case you missed it, let's put a tow truck. The biggest tow truck we can find in there, right? And there they are. This time they're puzzled. They don't know what to think, but they have to acknowledge her. And she's finally happy in reference to others she's finally happy in her skin so she's perfectly comfortable in this gesture in public for the first time and even though they're puzzled they have to react she's leading they're following right she's the leader in this dynamic they don't know what to think and they would like to express their fears and concerns but they play along because she has this energy that she's projecting that comes from having a car. She goes back home, she goes to the garage, and of course, she will realize that this is a bot, and looking under the car, she finds the eyes, we can't see the eyes, but they're there on a regular screen, and, and they look at each other, this would be her face, again, the projector is too dim, and finally, the light in the eyes and this huge thing comes out and they have this confrontation they don't know what to think but in case you were scared in case the kid inside of you was scared he gets entangled with a kite so you understand that it's like a puppy that he himself is scared of a red kite and and hides in a corner right so he's not aggressive violent is not a threat to her let me and oh this is interesting so the mother comes in 
And say, what is going on? And she's afraid. Charlie is afraid. At this point, she says, my mother has seen the robot. I don't know what will happen. She'll take the car. She'll call the police. So she's afraid. And then he has transformed back into a car. So a bomb is, is uh, being born in here. This is their secret, that he's not just a car, right? The mother cannot see what she sees. Now she's gaining powers. Before she was inferior to everyone else. Now she's gaining powers. And she's trying to realize what just happened, right? And again, she looks into the car and the car window is like a mirror looking back at her and she goes, to the headlight, which is like the eye, because she wants to have this close relationship, and he goes back into his droid format, and they look at each other, he's scared, and finally they get closer, and there it is, the big round eye, the puppy eyes, right, let's say, love me and she reacts by reaching to him and touching him fondly and kindly okay so let me skip and get to the end of this and then we'll watch a couple of scenes um, let me jump straight to the end Of course, at the end, the family will come together to rescue her. This time, the family is reaching out to Charlie, providing support, helping her escape the military vehicles that are chasing Bumblebee and Charlie. And see the family together. And finally, they look around they also look at her at some point. Let me show you. So the difference is now they're looking at each other. Now she's being recognized by her mother for the different person that she is. Right? Now they're a family unit. Now they're a family of four. She's a member of this family. And later on, I want to show you just a couple of frames. In order to save humanity, B-127 has sacrificed itself, going into this pool, being crushed by a big ship, and is about to die at the bottom of this pool. And she's afraid, but then she finds the courage, and she resumes her process of growing by diving. Again, this is the first loop that is closed. She had stopped diving, now she will dive into this incredible pool to save B-127. And they see each other and out they come as a different individual. And who's there to prove that they're different? John Cena. John Cena. And they look at each other, but this time is not there to represent a threat. It's there to confirm that they're actually heroes, that they're people with a lot of worth. Look, the seriousness of John Cena. She's surprised that John Cena is not there to attack them, to arrest them. She's surprised that someone is there to recognize what she and Bumblebee had done. They look a lot at each other and then Cena will salute him as a military guy. And go back.
and we have the final scene in which they're about to say goodbye near the Golden Gate. Bumblebee's about to go on his own way, the same for Charlie. She leaves the car, he opens the door because she must go back and she gets closer. We have this, this connection, right? But now she's very confident. She has a different face. She doesn't look like a teenager. Her expressions uh, are those of an adult. And, and then there is this. He looks around after they hug, looks at the bridge, finds a, oh my God, what is this, a transam, right? I'll be so embarrassed if it is not a transam. I've seen that car a million times. And he turns into a transam and she makes a turn, half a turn and says, what? So she says, you could have been this kind of cool car the whole time. And what does that mean? It means quite simply that even she, Charlie, could have been this kind of cool woman the whole time. She just needed to look and find the code to transform into a woman that is as cool as this car. And she does, because he goes away, and what is that she does after she goes back home and they all hug each other and find each other? There it is. She works on the Corvette, the Corvette is done. He changed into the cool sports car of the 1970s and 80s, one of the coolest. She is now driving this incredible Corvette with dark glasses. And again, she looks like a very confident, strong woman. She's understood the lesson that she could also turn into something else. And there we have it. So, 